Yep. Here is where we preview what I foresee as the three best soundbar systems money can buy. If we were to take an epic time machine journey all the way to let's say fall 2023, after everything has hopefully been released. The first system is a refinement on a popular line. The second, a company's entry into a higher tier. And third, well, a creation reset level of it. Hey, what's up my soundbar curiosos? Daniel here from Never Enough Tech. First up, the latest installment of Samsung's very popular Q900 line and successor to the 2022 Q990B. Wait for it. The Q990C. Now, I kind of naively thought that the Q990B was a minor release. You know, maintaining the channel count from the previous year, where the two previous versions, the T and the A, both upped the channel count by two. The B year, so 2022, was a you know, smooth out the bumps year, and 2023 would be attention grabbing. This is decidedly not the case. Now, the Q990B is probably the world's best overall sounding soundbar a consumer can buy at the time of this recording. But if excitement for a product is proportional to tangible added goodies over the last version, the C is amongst the least exciting products to ever exist. Which is absolutely impressive, as when the C releases, it's probably going to still be the best all around sounding soundbar system money can buy. So, what has changed with the C? The first improvement category, better Q Symphony. 3.0 I've heard bantered about, so enhanced coordination between the TV and the system, which is promoted as boosting dialogue and 3D sound. Typically, to take advantage of the newest Q Symphony benefits, you need a very new Samsung TV. Typically one released the same year as the bar. So that prickly requirement dramatically limits how many customers actually benefit from the latest Q-Symphony features, particularly in the short term. The second improvement category, improved AI neural engines and making them more central in sound crafting, assisting in clearer dialogue, highlighting ambient sound details, and remastering 3D audio, giving it more contour and intelligibility. As I understand, these improvements will largely be delivered via an enhanced version of Samsung's SpaceFit Sound room tuning feature and an AI-boosted adaptive sound mode. It could very well be that the C sound is significantly better than the B. I doubt it, but I love being proved wrong. Either way, I suspect the B will retain more of its value than it would otherwise, as the C may very well be the B with a side-loaded software update. Okay, let's spice it up a bit. Next up, the tippity-top model of the 2023 JBL soundbar lineup, the JBL Bar 1300X. I don't know where the X came from. I'm just gonna keep saying it because it's fun. Now, you might be wondering if the 1300X is merely some slick new way to write JBL Bar 9.1. Uh, no. While there are clear design carryovers like detachable rear speakers, gray, and general shape, the 1300X is a far more intimidating animal, signaling JBL wants a system that can unapologetically ride alongside the big boys. For context, the JBL Bar 9.1, released in 2020, a 5.1.4 channel system, would fall between the 700 and 1000 channel count wise. That is, the previous flagship, the 9.1, falls significantly short of the 23 lines second tier bar. So yes, JBL has dramatically upped their game. The 1300X is a $1,700, 1,170 watt, 11.1.4 channel system, matching Samsung's Q950A and Q990B's previous unmatched channel count. Some friendly fire there as they are owned by the same company. Though the 1300X does fall short of Samsung by a single driver reportedly having 21. But I'm going a little nutty because after watching this cartoon a thousand times, I only see 19 drivers and adding one for the woofer gets you to only 20. So about that woofer, many are saying it's a 12 incher and they may very well be right, but official material says 10 inches. 
Either the bloggers were misled or we have a JBL comms team not communicating well with engineering type situation. The 1300X speaker configuration does not seem to match the official 11.1.4 specification. By looks anyway. I mention this because one of JBL's talking points is its six upward firing speakers. One more than the previous leader in this category, the LG SN95QR. So why is this not an 11.1.6 channel system? I don't know. It also doesn't have 11 horizontal channels in the traditional sense. It has nine, the best I can tell. That is, if you encountered this system torn apart on the street somewhere after a soundbar mugging, when reporting to the soundbar police, you would describe this as a 9.1.6 system. Here is my traditional read on the channel placement. So for horizontal channels, ear level channels, we have a left, center, and right, and two surround channels on the front of the bar, but they're angled out, and a rear and rear surround on the detachables. So five ear level channels on the bar and four on the detachables, so nine. Height channels, two left and two right upward firing channels on the bar. They're angled differently to improved height dispersion. So, so something like a front and mid, directly overhead, height channel left and right. On the detachables, you got a single upward firing driver on each, making up the rear height left and right. So officially documented as 11.1.4, again by looks, and I'd say tradition, 9.1.6. The features. As you would expect, you got eARC, three HDMI inputs, that's good. And based on the JBL Bar 1000 specs, I would expect Dolby Vision and HDR10 pass through. I have not found any documentation to suggest 8K or 4K 120 Hertz pass through, so guessing you're stuck with 4K 60 Hertz. Correct me if I'm wrong. Not surprisingly, you get compatibility with the JBL One app. That is looking improved, I think, though I don't have a lot of experience with it. Though I do think these EQ controls look promising. You got AirPlay, Chromecast, and Alexa multi-room audio support, so three multi-room technologies, if that's your thing. And yes, I forgot to mention that the detachable speakers can act as a standalone Bluetooth speaker pair. One of the most hyped sound features is Harman's multi-beam technology. JBL first introduced this into their smaller bars, like the multi-beam 5.0, to give it a spatial boost. But JBL wants you to hear what multi-beam can do when it's got more noisemakers to work with. The 1300X is also looking to end all your dialogue problems with Pure Voice, which is present across the entire 23 lineup. The claim is that Pure Voice boosts dialogue and loud scenes, making it discernible at all times. It's not hard to make dialogue discernible at all times, but it's difficult to make it discernible and natural at the same time. So that will be a particular point of interest when I review. The 1300X is scheduled to arrive at my doorstep in late February, so look for my dedicated hardcore deep dive review in early March. Okay, the last one, but definitely not least. Let's call it a product that is not so much looking to sit at the big boy table, but rather burn it to the ground and replace it with a bedazzled throne. Now, unless you've been hibernating 500 feet underground in a bunker, you have probably heard that Nakamichi is resurrecting its Dragon brand with the recently revealed, don't call it a soundbar soundbar system, the Nakamichi Dragon 11.4.6. While in this case, the Dragon came out of nowhere, this is not its first sighting. The Dragon emerges not so much to invent new categories, but rather to push existing product categories to something like their highest foreseeable potential. Anyway, the Nakamichi Dragon 11.4.6 is no different. It's a 3000 watt 11.4.6 channel audio system that happens to look a lot like a soundbar system. In either case, it's supporting five more channels than the next closest soundbar system, whatever those might be. Nakamichi wants potential customers to think high-end AVR alternative, as it supports more channels than all AVR systems that sane people might wanna buy for home use. I think you need to shell out north of $30,000 for an 11.4.6 AVR system, and well, 
that does not even cover amplification or the speakers themselves. In contrast, because you're probably curious, the Q990C and 1300X with 11.1.4 channels or in AVR language, 15.1 channels, is a different tier in the AVR space running as low as $4,500. The good news, the Dragon costs only $112. Per driver, the bad news, you have to buy 31 of them at a time. So that puts you at $3,500, which is the expected MSRP. This is an astronomical price for a soundbar system, but merely a rounding error for a full AVR system that supports 11.4.6. So just how loud does this thing get? Well, 125 decibels SPL, which I believe to technically be divorce level loud. You know if you're thinking on going that direction and want to reduce your net worth. Maybe the dragon is for you. Don't worry, this channel is a 100% male safe space. First up, the main unit. Yep, that's what Nakamichi calls it. I'm gonna call it a soundbar because I have eyes. It's 58 inches wide, so just two inches shy of five feet, 4.4 inches tall, so who needs to see the bottom of the TV anyway, and 7.6 inches deep. Grow up. It weighs 31.5 pounds, making it 10 pounds lighter than the Ambio, but typically the soundbar on these multi-piece sets fall well below 20 pounds. This is a pretty interesting detail. The soundbar housing is made of a single piece of stainless steel. The manufacturing process was so out there that they had to use a vehicle panel supplier to get it machined. The housing has 116,000 precision drilled holes for the grill. The soundbar is a 7.0.4 channel speaker with 17 drivers. The left, right, and center are traditional flagship channels in that they each have two woofers and a tweeter. So, same with the Q990B and Klipsch Cinema 1200. The woofers are all three inches, round, and frankly, generic looking. The tweeters are AMT, or Air Motion Transformer tweeters. I don't have experience with this variant. Uh, they are generally associated with higher end audio and are pricier than the kinds of tweeters you might normally find on a soundbar. They are promoted as having very low distortion at high volumes, exceptional detail, and being particularly well-suited at emphasizing spatial effects. The surround left and right channels are packaged behind these angled edges. On the sides, you will find an additional woofer acting as your wide angle left and right channels. The four upward firing drivers are all the same three inch woofers. Like the JBL bar 1300X, they are dual angled, which I suppose gets you something like, again, a front and mid overhead high channel, left and right. So about those Omnimotion wireless surrounds, each is nine inches wide, 8.4 inches deep, and 10 inches tall. This is freaking huge for an all-in-one box soundbar system speaker. It's not as tall as an A9 speaker, which is a different animal, but it's bigger in every other aspect. At 8.8 .8 pounds, it's near one and a half times the weight of an A9 speaker. Bottom line, these are not anywhere near the norm from a physicality perspective. So as impressive as these surrounds are, which Nakamichi is calling reference level, there are only two of them, not four as with the Nakamichi 9.2, which perhaps has a viable claim for best 3D audio soundbar system performance. Some might think I'm being a little silly, but this only two thing gives me pause and places a little devil on my shoulder saying, can this monument of sound exceed or even match the nuts and bolts spatial effectiveness of the 9.2. I'm a warrior. Anyway, both surrounds are admittedly the increasingly normal 2.0.1 channel speakers. However, the two ear level channels are unique in that they offer both a woofer and a tweeter, which is uncommon outside of the three most important channels on the front of the soundbar. Though the aspect of the surrounds that's perhaps drawing the most attention is the rotating upward firing drivers, which explains the Omni Motion moniker. Though in this case, Omni is short for half of Omni or 180 degrees. Now with a system of this caliber, one's imagination may embark towards a motor driven upward firing speaker that spins around in real time to optimize the listening experience. Uh, 
No. It's not motorized. You gotta get off your bum and make it happen yourself. Which means your friends will be far less impressed, but also it won't break down in an unfortunate position. So be happy about that. Anyway, the high drivers are rotatable because depending on the peculiarities of the room, along with the eccentricities of the owner's desired speaker placement, well, with boring 0% Omni motion rears, your speaker mounting position may result in a suboptimal height driver orientation. This happens pretty much any time you mount to the back wall, where the height drivers orient straight forward, which is probably not where you're sitting. With Omnimotion, however the rear speakers may be situated, you can turn the height drivers as needed to help maximize height effects from your seated position. Okay, the subs. That's right, two of them, which is the Nakamichi way, I suppose. Unlike the rest of the components, each sub is not remarkable in size. Each is 12 and a half by 8.6 by 25 inches and weighs 32 pounds. Channel count and drivers. So each sub is actually an 0.2.0 speaker with a woofer pointing left and right on each unit, explaining the quad moniker. Each have an isobaric configuration. I'm not an expert, but it seems it's associated with some power efficiencies and allows for similar performance in smaller housing. I hope to get smarter when I get my hands on these subs, but in the meantime, if you wanna read the most catty thread out there on this speaker technology, pursue this page. Nakamichi is claiming four channels here. That is probably pushing it a bit as there are two woofers on each sub and they're not independent, so they share an air source. Also, it's not clear if the two sub units are receiving different signals. In any case, there are four side firing woofers that can probably be felt in the deepest depths of your butt. Okay, system features. First, codec support. Yes, DTSX and Atmos are supported, but something more interesting is happening. I'll do my best to explain. This system not only has enough channels, but enough processing power, so 15 digital amplifiers, probably etc., to render Atmos and DTSX tracks at, let's say, a professional theater level. So in the case of Atmos, let's call it AVR level Atmos, the Dragon can decode up to 24.1.10 channels. So yes, 35 discrete channels. In the DTS case, well, the Dragon is DTSX Pro compatible, meaning it can decode up to 32 channels. Yes, you might be feeling it deep in your stomach, the sad part of this realization means every soundbar was given a, let's say, lesser 3D decoder ring, so a ring that supports only up to 7.1.4 channels, because 10 years ago, it was somewhat unthinkable that soundbars were going to ever get that ridiculous. Oops. So, with a lesser decoder ring, after a soundbar's channel level exceeds 7.1.4, which is no longer uncommon, it's kind of a do your thing in regards to how it's going to use excess channels to support the 3D audio format. This is often resolved just by doubling down on a channel, though some manufacturers may be more creative. In any case, neither of these techniques are ideal. Dolby and DTS know best how to use channels for the Atmos and DTSX effects you want. The cheapest AVR that supports DTSX Pro is $3,500, so even most AVRs are stuck with this soundbar level rendering. So yes, mostly a sad story for your now completely defunct soundbar and maybe AVR too. Some good news though, your existing Blu-rays are compatible with this enhanced rendering tool. No need to find better Blu-rays. The Dragon is just capable of distributing the metadata to all the channels, not merely a subset. More specs three HDMI inputs, 8K and 4K 120 hertz, Dolby Vision, HDR10 plus pass-through, and more. I don't think the Dragon connects to the internet, so no integrated services or voice assistance, no AirPlay or Chromecast. So if this bothers you, you can put a Chromecast in one of the three HDMI ports to give the thing some internet savvy. Bluetooth is supported, and early reports from the Dragon CES suite suggest promising music playback, though I'm more interested in the music over HDMI performance. I don't have all the information on the sound shaping options and can't seem to get a clear view of the remote, which is 
the sole controller of the dragon, no app. But listening to the CEO keynote on this thing, it seems as though there will be relatively high levels of customization. One detail the CEO shared is that you can choose how many subs you want to use, so zero to four in any combination. Perhaps looking into existing Nakamichi products might provide clues onto other kinds of sound adjustments customers can access. I talk about the 9.2 remote in far too much detail in this review. No doubt the Dragon comes across as unbelievably disruptive. I'm almost more interested in what the industry response will be than the sound. Will the Dragon spark a category of ultra premium soundbar systems at a higher price point? Are the jumbo corporations willing to invest a lot in development in a nutty expensive product that may not sell at the kind of scale that makes business sense? I'm kind of hoping that the response or existing plans are not necessarily to follow Nakamichi, but to experiment with additional components to naturally move the sound separation closer to that of higher end AVR setups. Hopefully relying a little less on extreme DSP techniques, but maintaining the relative ease of setup and relative affordability of soundbar systems compared to mid and high end AVRs. Before I go, if you haven't seen it, take 10 minutes or so to listen to the CES keynote on the Dragon 11.4.6. Lots of interesting insights into the aims of the CEO and how impractical the development process was. Okay, wrapping this up, throw me some likes and subs if you accidentally got this far. Catch you on the next one.